Welcome everyone to another edition of the Selling Greenville podcast. I'm your host, Stan McCune, realtor here in Greenville, South Carolina, and it is June the 5th. I'm recording this uh, on the heels of a very busy week in which I was uh, trying to refinish my deck frantically before uh, yesterday's rain came in. The finish that I was putting down on the deck needed four hours to dry prior to any rain hitting it. And uh, we had to do all kinds of masking and taping uh, below our deck. And then a lot of cleaning of the deck, a lot of other things like that, a lot of prep work. And then finally we were able to refinish it and we, we completed the refinishing. It took us two days. Now our neighbor told us it would take us two weeks. So uh, we finished it in uh, two days, really more like one and a half days um, was what my wife and I spent doing that. And uh, we finally got that refinished at uh, about noon yesterday. And then the rain came in about 6, 6.30 last night. So we uh, we finished it with, with about two, two and a half hours to spare. But I am really tired. I've spent uh, like 20 hours this week working on this thing. And uh, I am glad to be done with that. And I'm going to try to overcome the achy legs and achy arms and everything else in order to bring you guys some energy for this podcast. Because I've got a, a, a topic that I'm really excited to talk to you guys about. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. But before uh, we get into that, just real quick, just a reminder, as always, you can find all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach me. If you need a realtor, if someone else you know needs a realtor, please reach out to me however you want. Contact info in the show notes. And if you like the show, please rate and review us. Please go ahead and uh, subscribe to make sure you don't miss any episodes. If you're going to be going somewhere where you might lose cell phone reception or something like that, download it. All of those things help get this show out to more people. Now for our topic at hand today, we are going to be doing a bit of a tips and tricks episode. Yes, tips and tricks in real estate, specifically focused on one specific tip or trick, depending on how you look at it, that we call the backup offer. Now, some of you may be very familiar with this. Some of you may not be familiar with it at all. Um, A lot of realtors are not familiar with it. It's funny how often I will mention this to other realtors and they'll be like, uh, what, what is that? I've never heard of that. Um, that is because a lot of realtors, you know, they come, they might be in smaller firms or they might be uh, on, on firms or teams that don't discuss these types of things because they're focused so much on sales and on generating business, on generating new clients that they're not focused on um, actually what are some of the things that you can do to, to add value to your service? So I try to have a lot of different tricks up my sleeve um, as a realtor. That's part of how I try to differentiate myself. And this is one of those that I think people need to know more about. And I'm fine with sharing this trick to the masses because I want more realtors to know about it because it helps our industry when everyone knows how to do things that are uh, useful it, when people are more educated, that's a good thing. We don't want uh, all these things to just be held by a handful of realtors in the marketplace. I want everyone to know about uh, these types of things so that we have a fully educated, well-run real estate machine here in the upstate of South Carolina. Now, this isn't an upstate-specific episode, but I don't know in other markets how this would work, if there might be laws that prevent some things. Here in uh, in the upstate, um, we have done backup offers multiple times, and uh, they can work very, very well. We don't have any issues that I'm aware of legally with, with anything related to those, as long as everything is in writing. That's the key. So what is a backup offer? Okay, well, um, it's Pretty much what it sounds like. If there is already a contract on a house, someone can put a backup offer in on that same house, and that backup offer has language in it that if the primary contract falls through, then the backup contract 
assuming it was ratified, becomes the primary contract upon the former primary falling through. All right, so here's an example. Let's say that uh, there's a house that is under contract and someone comes along and they say, you know what, I really wanted that house and I just, I was a little bit late getting to it. Um, I, I missed it for some reason. I would really like to still have a shot at that house. They can submit an offer, just like a normal offer, but the offer has language that makes it the primary contract should the current primary contract fall through under one its one of its contingencies. And then they are just hoping that that contract, that primary contract falls through. Of course, I need to specify, the seller has to agree to this, right? There, There is still a bit of a back and forth, a bit of a negotiation that goes on from the time that the backup offer is made until the time it becomes a backup contract. Um, and that's that's pretty normal. But uh, you get, once everything is fully ratified, the backup contract is in place and it becomes the primary contract should the primary contract fall through. And uh, this is a very useful tool. It can be a very useful tool in a variety of situations for both buyers and sellers. Now, from the buyer perspective, I, I just kind of mentioned a scenario in which it could be useful, which is particularly if you miss on miss out on a house that you really liked, something that it was the, the perfect house, your dream home. Maybe you were waiting to get pre-approved or, or maybe, you know, you had a house that uh, you were trying to sell and it wasn't under contract, so you weren't able to really submit a, a strong offer um, you know, with your home sale contingency, whatever it may be, the house that was your dream home got locked up by someone else. And now you're like, ah, I have been looking, I have been educating myself on the market for a long time. And I know that there is not going to be another house for a very long time that comes on the market like that house. I don't see anything else on the market that I'm interested in. I'm willing to take myself off the market, potentially at risk of completely losing out on that house or other homes that come on the market in the meantime in order to submit a backup offer and get a backup contract on that house. Because that's the thing, right? That is still a ratified contract. You, you need to keep that in mind as a buyer that you are still on the hook potentially for that house. So you can't keep shopping. You can't submit a backup offer and then keep shopping. I mean, you have to have earnest money with that. If you terminate that contract, you have to terminate, uh, you have to, to surrender your earnest money as well. So, so there is a risk there. And maybe you, you submit a low enough earnest money uh, that you're willing to take that risk. I don't ever recommend to anyone uh, to submit a contract that they're not serious about and that, uh, that they're not willing to actually take themselves out of the market uh, in order to commit to that property. But there's a lot to consider when you're submitting a, a backup offer. You need to be fully committed to that house and realize that you might run into a situation where another home comes on the market that you really like and now you're stuck in this weird situation. Do I surrender my earnest money to go after this house? Um, or, or do I just stick with this house and take the risk? that I never end up becoming the primary contract on that one, there is a lot to consider on that. But if it's a house particularly that is unique in some ways, a property that has some unique features that you are pretty sure you're not going to see come on the market in the upcoming months, that's a great opportunity to submit a backup offer. Another um, one that is a, a good scenario here for a buyer is if you already know, and your realtor can help you with this usually, if you already know that there are some issues with the primary contract, this helps to mitigate your risk. So maybe there's a home that's been on the market for a while, um, and or I should say this, it's, it's been under contract for a while. And by a while, I mean, you know, maybe like, going on about two months. I mean, maybe even, you might even check on it if it's less than that. 
But if something's been under contract for like two months, there's probably something wrong. There's probably something going on there. And if it's a property that you're interested in, have your realtor reach out to the listing agent and be like, hey, what's the deal here? Why have you been under contract for two months? What's going on? And it may be the kind of thing where maybe the buyer is having trouble with financing and they keep dragging it out and they keep agreeing to extending their current contract, but it, it doesn't look good. Or maybe there's a lot of issues with negotiating on repairs. Maybe the buyer is being picky on repairs, et cetera, et cetera. If the seller had a backup contract in hand, that might completely change the dynamics. They might decide, you know what? Forget this. We're not going to take the bird in hand. We're going to go ahead and, and just kind of end things with this buyer who can't get financing or whatever it may be, and we're going to go ahead and move forward with a different buyer. Uh, in that case, a backup offer can really be a, a powerful tool because you already have a, a good chance of, of the primary contract falling through because you already have insider information that they're having issues. Um, so th there are several things, again, there to consider. If it's a property that just went under contract, you're less likely for the backup offer to work as you are if if it's a home that has been under contract for a while and is starting to, you know, the buyers are starting to get uh, to the point where it might not close and the, and the sellers are starting to get worried that it might not close or that they're having issues or whatever the case may be. Now, one thing that I'm surprised about, because I work with a lot of investor clients, and maybe this is just something I need to discuss more with my investor clients, a, a lot of them don't like to, to um, contract with a property unless they're very certain that they, can, uh, that they can acquire the property. But I think a lot of investor clients should consider submitting backup offers on properties that... Uh, have a chance of falling through the contract, on falling through the primary contract um, that that they have under them. Because there are a lot of properties that are on the market that are interesting, that, uh, that come on for a low price that an investor would be interested in, and someone immediately gobbles it up. And it might be a multi-offer situation, whatever the case may be. Someone comes in, they gobble it up. But a lot of those end up falling through because during the due diligence period, the uh, the buyers, you know, their financing might fall through. A lot of these investor clients out there aren't even serious, so they're just trying to get something under contract for a good price, and then they do their due diligence. Then they they find a reason to break the contract. So if you're a serious investor buyer, it's an opportunity for you because so many of those types of properties lose out, end up having their, their, their first contract not working out, you have an opportunity to come in there and to be able to submit that backup offer to get it under contract as a backup. And then a large percentage of the time, those primary contracts will fall through. Uh, when it's a first contract on, on a property that is priced low and, and needs a lot of work. And so there are some good opportunities out there for uh, investor buyers as well. Now, one caveat here. As I said before, a lot of realtors are not familiar with this backup offer process. And as such, some listing agents might feel uncomfortable with that. Some brokers might feel uncomfortable with that. They might feel like, you know what? I, I don't know what that is. That seems fishy to me. And I don't want to, I don't even want to get involved with that. Um, so it, it's not, a guarantee uh, by any stretch that it will work out, that all the parties will agree to it, but it is a great tool to have in your toolbox. And if you're a realtor listening to this, or if, if you're uh, a, a buyer client of a realtor that is not me, um, bring it up. Uh, to whoever it is that you need to bring it up to to learn more about it and, and to see if it's a viable strategy for you to use. For sellers, it is also a great strategy to consider. 
the one of the the things that as a seller that you are most concerned about when you're selling your home, you get it under contract. The worst thing that happens is when you get it under contract and then the contract falls through and it has to go back on the market. And of course, in uh, the software that we realtors use, which is called Paragon, some of you might know it as the MLS, Paragon keeps a log of that. You can see exactly when it went under contract, exactly when it fell through. And I can assure you as a listing agent, when I have a, a listing that is under contract and then the contract falls through, I'm going to get questions from other buyers, from buyer's agent, why did that not work out? Why did that fall through? And it is a lot better, let me tell you, than having to put it back on the market, having to field all those questions, having people feel like they have a lot of leverage. A lot of buyers will feel like, ooh, what? You know, this seller is probably more motivated now than they were a few weeks ago. I, let me put an even lower offer than I would have considered a few weeks ago. Um, it's a lot better if you can just agree to a backup offer, a backup contract, and then if that primary contract does fall through, you don't even have to worry about it going back on the market. You can just continue, uh, keep it as it's under contract, it's, and nobody needs to know. that There's no way to reflect in the MLS that it went from one contract to another uh, because there isn't a status for that. So nobody will even know um, oh, this just changed from one contract to another contract. And then if the second contract falls through, it'll look, it'll look like in the MLS, like it was just one contract the whole time. And that's also beneficial. It's really bad if you have multiple contracts fall through on a property and that's reflecting on the MLS. You don't want that to happen. Um, as a seller, it, negotiating on a backup offer is oftentimes a lot less stressful than negotiating on a uh, an offer that would be a primary because the buyer bringing the backup offer is probably really serious they i mean it, for them to be willing to submit a backup they have to really like the property they have to really be interested in it and you have all the cards as a seller in this situation because Hey, if, if you don't like the backup offer that you're getting, you can just reject it. You have nothing to lose. You already have the property under contract. The backup offer is uh, just an added bonus. So you can hold out for the best possible backup offer that you can get. And, and here's the irony here, okay? So I had a, a listing last year that um, that was like this, where we did end up getting a backup offer. The backup offer ended up being better than the contract that we had the property under. Now you have to be careful. Ethically, you are still under contract. You can't try to, uh, and I would never encourage someone to try to, to find a way to alienate the current buyer that they have. It's a risky strategy anyway uh, to try to alienate the current buyer that you have in order to get the backup contract to become the primary. Don't do that. That's not what I'm saying to do. But you could run into situations like that. And uh, that's a really great uh, story as well because my next point uh, that I was going to make is that having the backup contract in hand really puts the seller in the driver's seat. And, uh, and this story of this listing that I had, here's what happened. We had it under contract and the buyer came back. I mean, this was a good house that had been renovated, had had a, a lot of things done to it. The buyer came back with an inspection report with a list of like six pages of repairs that they wanted to be done. And I mean, it was absolutely insane. Um, I've only seen something like this a few times in my entire real estate career. It was ridiculous. The inspector, we, we had just had flash flooding. This is a, this was uh, you know, again, more flash flooding that we had several months ago. We had just had some flash flooding. They found a little bit of standing water in the crawl space. I mean, they wanted all sorts of things done in the crawl space because they had a little puddle of water underneath, you know, the stoop or something like that uh, in the crawl space area. 
after a flash flood. And it's like, you know, okay, people, let, let's have some common sense here. There has never been standing water down there. And, and there wasn't. We knew that there wasn't because we had had uh, other people go down there. We had had a pest control guy go down there to do some stuff before. And we had already had a, a past CL100 done. Um, anyway, the long story short is that we had this unreasonable buyer. And it was like, well, I don't know that this is going to work out very well. And they had already been difficult up to that point. So I get a call from a lady who is like, hey, um, my daughter, and, and when a conversation starts out like this, it's always like, oh boy, here we go. We got a, a mother calling on behalf of, of her children or a father calling on behalf of his children. But okay, here we go. So this woman calls me. She's like, my daughter saw your house on, you know, 123 XYZ Street. And um, she really liked it. This was several weeks ago, but you went under contract. They didn't, uh, they weren't yet pre-approved, but they are now. We just wanted to see, you know, is that contract going to work out? Like, what's the, what's the situation there? First off, I was a little bit concerned, I'm not going to lie, I was a little bit concerned that it was the mom calling for the daughter rather than the daughter, or as it turns out, they had a buyer's agent, so really, the buyer's agent should have been the one calling me, um, but, you know, the, the mom wanted to, to take the reins on things, um, and and in this story, as, as you're about to see, it, it does work out, so I guess I can't uh, scold her too much for that. Um, it's more just disappointing that the buyer's agent wasn't aware, but regardless, um, she, uh, she was wanting to know how firm our current contract was. And I was like, well, you know what? It's actually not very firm at all because these buyers are really getting nitpicky with this property and they're, they've been difficult to work with. And I would say that there is a decent chance that this is all going to fall through. So here's my recommendation to you. Go back to your agent or have your daughter go back to her agent and submit a backup offer. Because we'll know in the next week or two if it's going to fall through anyway, and then we can just, you know, if if it ends up looking like it's going to work out, um, you know, it's not going to be very long before we know that for sure. So we won't be, you know, in a situation where, where you guys are going to get strung out. But I would say, based on my experience, that there's a high likelihood that this contract is going to fall through. And the mom was like, okay, all right, I'll talk to them about that. And sure enough, I hear from the buyer's agent shortly thereafter, and she wants to talk about submitting a backup offer. And so we did. And so when we had to uh, respond to, so so we, I, I should mention, we did get under contract. And, and this was a situation where the backup contract was was a little bit better than the primary. So it, it was good in a lot of ways. And, and we... Uh, me as the listing agent, my seller, we felt very confident these buyers really wanted the house. And then when when the the primary contract, when those buyers came back to us with six pages of repairs, you know what that told us? Usually that is a very good sign that these people don't really want the house. If you ask for six pages of repairs, you, you know what? When I bought my house, the house that I currently live in, I really wanted the house, all right? So I could have gotten nitpicky with the with the sellers and, and asked for things that, uh, you know, were kind of unnecessary and tried to make them, you know, turn into a negotiation back and forth and, and try to get them to do a bunch of stuff. But I really just wanted the house. So I just submitted a few core repairs that, that we wanted done. And that was it. And that's what most buyers that really want a house are going to do. Usually if they sub submit a list of six pages of repairs, that's not a house they want. They're already concerned with a lot of things about that house. And they're like, well, if they're willing to do all these repairs, then I guess I'm, I'll feel okay you know, moving forward. So when they submitted those repairs, we were in the driver's seat, right? Because we already had a backup contract in hand. Um, and so we could be like, you know what, we'll agree to the core repairs. Again, my seller was not, um, was not the type of seller that was going to um, be unethical or, 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 or treat the, the primary buyer 
differently on the basis that he had a backup contractor. He still agreed to do all the repairs that were necessary according to the contract that we had signed. The contract here in South Carolina, Form 310, it specifies what it calls seller paid repairs. Um, he agreed to all the seller paid repairs and more, way more than that. But it wasn't six pages worth of repairs. And um, long story short, they were not happy about that. And, uh, and they ended up, we ended up going back and forth. And because we had a backup contract in hand, it was just like, you know what? If you guys don't want the house, we'll just let you go. You can go ahead and take your earnest money. We don't care. We, are, we have someone else that wants the house. And that's exactly what happened. We let them go. The people that really wanted the house, their contract, which is the backup contract, became the primary. And it, we, uh, in the meantime, we went ahead and did the repairs that we already knew needed to be done. My seller went ahead and did those repairs. The inspection process for the new buyer went much more smoothly. They submitted a much more reasonable list of just a handful of repairs that they needed to, to have done after we had already uh, done some from the, from the previous buyer. And that was it. We got to closing. Everything was smooth. It was not a difficult process. And so having that backup contract in hand really put the, the seller in the driver's seat there, really gave the seller options and a lot more confidence to be willing to, uh, to, to not go crazy trying to hold the contract in place with these unreasonable buyers that we had. Now, again, the backup contracts, they, uh, they aren't particularly common, but I will, what will happen is when I'm in a situation like this, where I think that an offer might be falling through, or when I get, uh, a, uh, someone calling me about a house that's already under contract, I will start sowing the seeds in, in their mind of, Hey, you know, we're willing to consider backup offers here. This is a situation where a backup offer could be really strong. You could really have a chance. And, and then if this falls through, it won't hit the open market. You won't be in a bidding war type of situation. Why don't you go ahead and, and just bring us a backup offer? We can work out all the details now. And then if in a couple of weeks we end up getting to closing with the primary contract that we have, you're released. Uh, you'll get your earnest money back and all of that, and and we, you know, you won't have lost anything besides just a couple of weeks of uh, of the of what comes on the market. That uh, for a very for some very specific buyers can be a compelling sales pitch, and so I bring that up as often as I can when I'm talking to buyers agents or or when buyers call me directly about a home that's already under contract. Um, and so as a seller, it's, it's both a contingency plan for, uh, for your house or for your property that you're trying to sell. It's a contingency plan and it's a bit of a leverage tool. Um, you don't want to be in that situation where you feel like you need to do things to a house that you shouldn't need to do contractually or otherwise, because you just have an unreasonable buyer. If you have a backup contract in hand, it helps you to have a lot more confidence to stick to your guns and to be like, you know what? I know what reasonable repair requests are. I know what the contract says I'm obligated to do. And you're asking for a lot more than that. Um, or, or maybe it's a situation where, where their financing appears to keep falling through um, and they keep asking to extend the contract out. And we're not confident that they're going to ever get financing. You know what? We're not going to extend this contract anymore. You have not been able to get financing. Once the, the contract runs out, if you're not able to get financing and we're not able to close by then, we're moving on. We have a backup offer in hand. Um, that is a great position to be in as a seller. And it's something that um, I wish I could do on every single contract I have uh, that I'm a listing agent for because it's a really powerful tool and it's something uh, something to consider again uh, it's it's not used very widely in the marketplace and that's a shame 
It's a shame because um, it really it helps both parties. It helps the buyer that really wants the property and helps the seller that isn't sure that that you know the current contract is going to work out. Now I'll say as a listing agent, it's a lot of work, right? Because guess what happens? That buyer or the buyer's agent, they are calling me and texting me like every couple of days. Is there an update? Is there an update? Do do you know if if, if it's gonna fall through or not? Because they are on pins and needles, right? And as a buyer, particularly if it's a primary residence um, that you're that you're trying to get and that you have a backup contract on, you're gonna be on pins and needles. That's that's understandable. Um, but it is worth it because there are so many benefits gained from it. And, uh, and hopefully this will put some ideas in your mind. Maybe there are some properties that now you're thinking of in the past. It's like, man, I should have used, I should have put in a, a backup offer on that property. That would have had a great chance to, to, for me to get if it had fallen through. There's a lot of very interesting opportunities that it opens up once you start applying this this tip or this trick to the marketplace. And so think about it. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know what your thoughts are. This is something that, uh, that I try to use uh, in my tactics for my buyers and for my sellers when it's appropriate. And maybe it's something that could be appropriate for you. I'd be happy to discuss that with you. Again, all my contact information is in the show notes. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Maybe if we get some nice weather, you can spend some time in the pool. If if the pools are opened up, my community pool, it opened up on Monday. I think I'm going to float in there for a few minutes at some point this weekend. So enjoy the warmer weather, stay safe, and we'll catch you next time.